Hello and welcome back to today's review and today we're going to look at the TS873AU. It is their 8 bay half depth rack mount for 2020. It utilizes a lot of the hardware architecture we've seen on a lot of their new releases and mixes it up a little bit by bringing in a lot of the business conventions and still managing to keep it pretty tight let's be honest um this device although it does have a price tag that some of you may be a bit mm, put nose out of joint about around about 1900 quid including the tax it is aimed at small medium business but it is a solution that arrives with eight bays of storage redundant psu options at the rear upgradability in a number of ways and three years of warranty now this video is a hardware review. We're not looking at the software in this video. We will be doing a follow-up where we'll go into the software and check some of the performance. So if that's what you want, you might not get that from today's video. But what I will say is this is an impressive move by QNAP to move into um, a less showy way of doing their rack mounts. In the last few years, when we've seen a lot of their rack mount solutions, they seem to have come in two different flavors. We've had the ones at the bottom end generally ending in like the number 32 or something and they've been a little bit lackluster they've had great external performance but they've been hinged a lot more on the affordability we've seen a lot more cost effective solutions that arrive with hardware architecture that will hit a glass ceiling very early doors now at the other end of the spectrum they were releasing crazy town solutions ones that were like xeon this that and the other we saw a few intel cores along the way and for the most part, that middle ground wasn't really being serviced in my eyes. You were getting um, a few Celeron-based solutions, which were always nice, but there wasn't a lot of them. There was only like three. And then you had the bottom end and the top end getting loads of solutions. So this is a nice middle ground device. It arrives with uh, an Intel Ryzen SoC-based processor, and it is the Intel Ryzen V1500B, a server-grade processor, which is the quad-core at 2.2 gigahertz per core. It also arrives with four gig of DDR4 UDIM memory that can be upgraded up to an astounding 64 gig of storage across two slots, of memory there across two slots. So in terms of virtualization, you have a processor there because it's an x86 64-bit processor from AMD. You have got virtualization covered with the likes of Virtualization Station and um, uh, Ubuntu. Uh, they've changed from Linux Station to Ubuntu Station there or Ubuntu Support. Um, on top of that, you've got container support, of course. Um, on terms of surveillance, you've got QVR Pro and Surveillance Station as well as support of a myriad of IP cameras and USB cameras uh, alike in the webcam mode. On top of that, you have got a huge array of multimedia and business applications supported internally with file management being handled by FileStation, QSearch, and QFiling. You've got the multimedia support, as mentioned, by PhotoStation, VideoStation, Mu MusicStation, as well as QMaggie, and a myriad of third-party multimedia apps supported as well. On top of that, you have great cloud connectivity, and not just connectivity with cloud services, uh, via backups using hybrid backup sync 3 or the other backup apps but on top of that you have a lot of cloud synchronization tools so for example not only can you bolt on a cloud service quite easily in a kind of remote backup sense but you can also create cloud gateways between things like um, uh, Dropbox and Google Drive and those cloud blobs that are out there thanks to hybrid mount that allows you to mount cloud storage and make it appear localized to the system and vice versa. When you want the NAS storage to become readily accessible to other NASes and cloud services with virtual JBOD or VJBOD. On top of that, you have things like BoxSafe, where if you are using uh, cloud collaboration platforms such as G Suite and Office 365 where you've got all of your users and accounts and emails not only can that data be backed up to the NAS but the NAS can work as a viable alternative if you are severed from the internet connection you can clone um, you can um, um, resource gather and search through all of that information on those platforms as it's synchronized with the system and it allows a lot more creative control to that cloud data, as well as adding it as another layer of failover or backup in your business environment. There's a lot to be said for this. And I've mentioned a lot of software in this so-called hardware review. Um, 
it is an eight bay as mentioned it is half depth something i've in recent years come uh, come around on i wasn't a huge fan in the early days but i can see why half depth half depth rack mounts have become a thing it's because rack mounts are no longer this angry business led endeavor lots of home users whether it's for multimedia or a small home office users that want to have a server that is compact that has excellent cooling and has a great degree of expandability do seem to favor rack mounts overall feeling that desktops get too hot they've got plastic chassis they don't feel as robust there's a big contingent towards these and half depth rack mounts give you the kind of physical uh, stature you'd find in an 8 bay desktop but with the rack mount sense of build quality i mentioned build quality it's got three years of manufacturer's warranty and a whole lot of expandability i touched on there at the beginning now each one of those eight bays is SATA, which means um, it supports up to the very latest 18 TB NAS drives from the likes of Seagate Ironwolf. Um, and again, 20 TBs are just round the corner thanks to Heat Assisted Magnetic Recording, or HAMR. If you're a WD buyer, of course, you've got WD Red and their Energy Assisted Magnetic Recording, or EAMR, to consider down the line. Each one of the trays is metal and has screw holes for two and a half inch and three and a half inch media included with the kit. Before I go any further, these are the accessories. And again, I've already taken it out of the box because the box is massive and it arrives with plenty of foam protecting it from shock damage in transit. Inside, quick start installation guide, warranty information. It's got three by default, expandable up to five years if you need uh, information on the warranty. You've got two plugs, it's got a redundant power supplier and those are internal, which can be removed. And you have got a Cat5 E cable for the network connections and those screws for two and a half inch and three and a half inch media. Now, it is worth highlighting on this device that yes, it's a Cat5 E cable and a number of you are always kind of saying, well, it should be Cat6, Cat5 E is slow. This has 2.5 GBE, Cat5 E is fine. It's when you enter 10 GBE that you should be looking at those improved uh, RJ45 cables. There's no LCD panel there on the front. Um, it only has power button, and mute buttons there for when the alerts are going off. With the alerts, the sort of alerts you might get from a device like this might be if there's a drive failure, if there's a power failure, network issues. It's effectively audio alerts and it's nice to have the physical means to turn off. I kind of wish there was a new LCD panel. That's probably one of my first gripes about this device. I've always liked QNAP's attitude towards LCD panels. I think for the sake of having an LCD so you can just glance and know um, what's going on with your device if you want to know an IP so you can go straight into it manually without having to search around on your network uh, traffic. I like LCD, I'm surprised it doesn't have it, but maybe I'm in the minority. You don't need to fully populate this device, you can get away with just one drive if you choose, bit weird. But of course it supports RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, RAID 6, RAID 10, RAID 50, RAID 60. They're all supported on this device. It uses the EXT4 QUTS or QTS platform. It doesn't have support of the ZFS uh, QTS Hero right now, but its architecture is similar enough, I believe, to a number of devices like the H973AX, with the same CPU and memory architecture that I think it's not impossible that down the line this might get Hero, but that's by no means a guarantee. Um, if we have a look at the architecture on the rear, sorry about the noise near the mic, we'll lift that up there. You can have a look, and on the rear there, we can see a couple of PSUs straight away. Each one of those PSUs, they're rated down the rear as 300 watts, although I thought they were 250, so that's my mistake. Probably a mistake I made in the unboxing video now, in hindsight. Um, a redundant PSU, for those that don't already know, and it'll be a bit weird if you're watching this and you didn't know, a redundant PSU is the ability for your system to have basically a safety net, much like RAID has on hard drives. You've got two connections there. You've probably got loads of network shares, be they, you know, LUN targets or just Mac drives or VMs or anything like that, or the myriad of different ways you might have users constantly accessing your NAS. Redundant PSU means that if the PSU fails, bearing in mind the power supply unit is the second most frail thing on any server, after the hard drives, of course, it means that you can pull that drive out, which is included, by the way, in your warranty. So bear in mind, if this happens in those three years, you can just get a new one, they'll send you a new PSU, the system's still running on a single PSU, it doesn't need both of them, 
they're just running all the time and then when your new one arrives slot it straight in you can purchase a new one if you choose so then you've always got one in the cupboard and you don't even have to power the device off when reconnecting a new PSU so it means zero um, downtime it means you've got that fail safe there in the background and you can have that replacement PSU round pretty quickly I personally if I'm using a rack mount I would keep a spare PSU in a cupboard but I appreciate that if it's in your warranty you hope the brand will back you up and QNAP should do that um, we've got a couple of cooling fans that we're going to see from the inside in a little while and of course we have got those connections there now on the left hand side there we've got that little red connector that is two USB 3.2 Gen 2 connections that's 10 gigabit USB so that means we've got a USB-C and a USB-A port there for ex uh, external expansion devices and they also support a myriad of other USB ports you can even assign those USB ports to VMs if you choose or to surveillance measures and of course you can connect lot and lot of office peripheral devices as well and make them network accessible on top of that you've also got two USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports there those are five gigabits per second USBs and again there's a C and an A port there and that means that you can connect a lot more legacy USB devices as well. There are a lot of QNAP expansion devices, all of which use USB, that allow you to expand your storage. Just make sure you choose the right provisioning during the setting up of your volumes. And of course, your storage pools early doors. But on the side here, we have a PCIe slot, and it's a PCIe Gen 3 times 8 thanks to the PCIe lanes on that CPU inside, that Ryzen. It means that this device can allow you to add 10 GPE uh, and even dual 10GBE cards. You've got enough bandwidth on that PCIe to have dual port 10GBE and the CPU inside this will support you during that. Uh, that Ryzen inside has got, um, there's no confirmed score from CPU Benchmark. We've got a few scores knocking around, but it is comparable to a number of other Ryzen's um, uh, SOC embedded processors that are server grade in that product family. And they're all pretty good and we're seeing a lot of this CPU being featured across a number of the brands and I'm glad QNAP are involving it in a number of their systems. This is not the cheapest device for an 8 bay 1900 NICA including tax is not a low price tag but what I would argue is you are buying a server grade product in rack mount form and particularly half depth which generally in terms of construction makes a lot of the difference to the price tag and you do see a lot of comparatively more expensive solutions in half depth when compared to their full depth rack mount alternatives. Now, the rear of this device is normally screwed in. I've already removed them prior to this. So if we remove the rear of the device there, put that there, you can see looking inside that half of the overall storage uh, physical space is being taken up by the drives there at the top. There's a lot of space being occupied just by the storage media. So this half depth rack mount, you, if you're worried about it all being crushed together, don't worry. It's very well spaced out. As you can see here, if I balance that there, so I can have a look at it better. For a start, we can see that memory. Hopefully the light's not gonna go too crazy there. We've got the memory slots right there. And those memory slots, there's two of them. And each one of those UDIM slots, again, will support a 32 gig DDR4 module in there, so 64 gig, which is going to be great for virtualization, and particularly for you guys out there that are going to be taking advantage of those larger speeds. Got a huge heat sink right there, covering the main CPU, that Ryzen that's inside, and that Ryzen based processor inside there. Again, there's no operational fan there. The fans are here at the base of the device and built into the top here to draw air over both the drives and with active cooling over all the internal processors, the PCBs and the transistors. Um, we've got that little um, flash module there, a five gig module. That is where the OS lives. This arrives with QTS 4.4, um, 4, I believe. Uh, we're up to just recently going into 4.5.1, I believe. And of course that will be immediately available when setting the device up for the first time. But you've got to have some OS there on day one. We've got our PCIe slot over here which is where our upgrade cards live. And again, you've got that 10 GPE connection. You can add NVMe and dual uh, combo cards. I've got 10G and NVMe SSD cache to improve the internal performance on this. And as mentioned, we didn't really touch on that on those rear ports there. You can see those two LAN ports right there, each of which is 2.5 GBE. 
which means that with link aggregation, you've got a 5 GBE equipped NAS if you've got a rock the good, uh, managed switch in your environment and up to 500 megabytes transmission over those two ports. And of course, each one of them can be used uh, kind of paired up in a failover architecture or they can be utilized um, as completely independent connections. And that 250 megs each on a supported switch is something that can be shared by your connected users. QNAP have really embraced 2.5 GBE and I'm glad that this solution is not 1G by default. I know a number of us have been talking about um, devices out there that are still got 1 GBE and how in 2020 that seems a touch rudimentary. I'm pleased I haven't gone down that road on this. Again, is it perfect? No, I don't believe it is. I think there's a few things about this device I'm not overly keen on. I think first and foremost, the lack of HDMI. I know obviously the PCIe lanes have been spread accordingly on this, but I think it would have been nice to have this HDMI enabled given that that CPU does have that in it to be able to do GPU stuff. It's not an embedded GPU processor, but it can handle virtualization and surveillance. I think uh, HDMI out would have been handy on this to turn it into a more standalone interface when needed. Um, I think maybe the lack of M2 or NVMe inside, they've clearly made a choice in its architecture asking users to um, go with the PCIe upgrade route rather than um, adding NVMe SSD caching bays inside and then lowering the PCIe gen to make up for it internally. But I think users would have preferred to have some form of SSD slot inside to improve internal performance because caching is becoming a very, very hot topic right now. Something QNAP themselves are highlighting in a number of ways. They're even looking into that QSAL technology with um, SSD failure prediction, monitoring and uh, failure prevention. So I'm surprised we're not seeing more um, dedicated SSD bays inside this. But that's really it. I think the price tag might be a bit aggressive, but not much. Um, apart from that, I do like this as a rack mount solution, and I'm glad to see um, QNAP embracing um, a lot of the mid-range rack mount stuff a lot more and not spending as much time at the low, low, low and the high, high, high range of their portfolio. Um, thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. We will be doing testing on this very, very soon. So if you do have questions or queries or recommendations or things you want to see, do let me know. It's going to be recording in a few days, so I've got a bit of time there. Um, if you have enjoyed this, click like. If you want to learn more, click subscribe. And other than that, do visit the links in the description to both the hardware review and, of course, the guys at span.com to learn more about this device and, and get their free advice on whether this suits your needs. Other than that, I will see you next time.